Okay, good morning everybody. And um, I suppose appropriately, given that it's Halloween, uh, today we're going to be discussing blood. Buckets of blood. Blood is actually a very, very interesting and very important tissue in the body. If you look, think back to when we talked about tissues and membranes, you'll remember that we actually defined it as a tissue. It's a collection um, of cells which are all serving, coming together to serve common purpose, even though their individual functions are very different from one another. But it is a loose tissue. It's a liquid tissue. And we'll discuss its composition in a while. Blood actually has many, many different functions in the body. Um, the red color, by the way, of blood uh, is because of one particular set of cells in the blood, which contain hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a, is a pigment. It has a red color to it. And uh, that is the pigment which is responsible for transporting oxygen through the body. We'll talk about it in more detail in a while, but that's what gives it its red color. Um, so this blood has many different functions we need to talk about. And um, the very first thing is that blood is a major transport mechanism. And uh, as this is how we transport nutrients, for example, uh, throughout the body. Nutrients which are absorbed from the gut have, are transported first to the liver and then out to the rest of the body um, and to supply all of the cells of the body with the, the food the food and the fuel that they require, both for energy and for the molecules that we use to build up biomolecules. Uh, second of all, blood transports oxygen. It uh, transports oxygen bound to the hemoglobin and transports oxygen from the lungs to all of the areas of the body which are low in oxygen to supply them with oxygen. Blood also transports all the carbon dioxide that is produced as a result of cellular respiration. Um, carbon dioxide is the major waste product of res cellular respiration. The production of that cellular respiration is the production of energy from fuel that used by the body. And carbon dioxide has to be transported to the lungs to be expired. And blood uh, ha has two mechanisms actually for transporting uh, carbon dioxide. And lastly, uh, blood uh, transports waste products. All of the cells that are engaged in metabolism are producing waste products apart from carbon dioxide. And those waste products cannot accumulate. Instead, they are transported by the blood to organs of excretion, like the kidneys, for example. Um, it also transports um, uh, toxic substances and things like that to areas of the body where they can be detoxified. Detoxification, for example, is a major responsibility of the liver. So, number one, it's a transport mechanism. Second of all, blood has an important regulatory function. Now, I want to remind you of this word homeostasis. Homeostasis is the maintenance of optimal conditions. All cells in the body work to try and maintain their, their in, internal environment within optimal conditions. And all of the mechanisms which do so are referred to as homeostatic mechanisms. So blood is actually in it, uh, intimately involved with maintaining homeostasis of the whole organism because it it perfuses the entire organism it's a very very useful way for in, in a in a way for all of the cells of the body to communicate with one another the first way that they communicate is that blood transports substances for example like hormones Hormones are a communication mechanism. They're a communication mechanism between one part of the body and another. One part of the body may register that a certain condition is present, release hormones, which gets the rest of the body to adjust to those conditions. So that blood transports hormones. It's another transport mechanism, but it's a specialized transport mechanism. Second of all, Blood is very important for maintaining the body's pH. 
its balance of acidity and alkalinity. There are complex mechanisms in, in blood, mostly concerned with blood chemistry, with solutes in, in the blood. We were not going to discuss it in detail, but just to remember that the um, blood regulates the body's pH. Thirdly, here's something that you might not realize. Blood actually transports heat. It transports heat around the body and it can transport heat from one area which is too hot to areas where that heat can be voided. So blood is very important in regulating the body temperature. I'll give you an example. Um, we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail when we discuss circulation. But your hands, for example, are actually like radiators. So is your face. There are many, many blood, fine blood vessels in your face and in your hands. When your body is too hot, when the body core is too hot, those blood vessels are dilated. They open wide so that lots of blood can flow through them and radiate heat out to the environment. Uh, lastly, you realize, of course, that blood is basically an aqueous medium. It's mostly water, more than 90% water. And so it is transporting water around the body, and it is very, very important in regulating water content of cells. Cells respond to their internal environment by taking up water, for example, or by losing water to maintain an optimum water balance in the cells. And they do that by relating to the blood, which is the blood solutions which are flowing around them. Next, this is critically important, and we'll talk about it in, in really a lot more detail when we talk about the immune system. But the blood is part, blood forms part of your immune system. Many of the cells of your immune system, many of the cells which are going to respond in an immune response are present in your, the blood, and they are components of blood. So the immune system is going to re respond to two major events. One is the introduction of foreign material into the, into the bloodstream or into the body tissues. So foreign material like pathogens, for example, things like that. Your body responds in an immune response. And that immune response is conducted around the body by the blood. The other really important function of the immune system that you may not know is to survey the body for potentially cancerous tissue. And uh, again, those cells that do that are conveyed around the body uh, in the blood. Lastly, blood is protective because it produces, it has the ability to clot. And as a result, if we break the surface um, of, of a tissue like the skin or internally say the gut or something like that blood flowing out of that wound does not just carry on and on and on flowing unless there's something seriously wrong blood very soon after uh, the skin is wounded blood will clot it will form a distinct structure which will plug the the wound and stop further bleeding. And in addition, that clot will then start the whole healing process that will rebuild the tissues that were wounded. So blood is protective. So let's have a, uh, let's just think for a little while about how blood is made up. First of all, um, it's largely a clear liquid, a clear aqueous liquid and this is referred to as plasma. Um, and uh, if we allow blood, if we take a sample of blood, for example, and we allow the, the, the blood cells to clot and we spin them out, we're left with a clear, it's, we always say it's straw colored, it's this pale yellow liquid, um, which is, has a, a certain amount of viscosity you can, you can see it's not quite as, as liquid as water, 
um, and that is the plasma. Um, if, we, if, if we're talking about a situation like a wound, for example, where um, the, we see a clot forming and leaving liquid behind, we refer to that as serum, but it's the same thing. Plasma and serum are the same thing. Floating in that serum, um, in that plasma, there are many, many different kinds of blood cell. And uh, we're, just, we're not going to talk to about them in enormous detail, but I want you to learn uh, some of the different kinds and some of their different functions. The most obvious ones are the erythrocytes, the red blood corpuscles. They are by far the commonest of all of the blood cells. But there's also a group of cells called the leukocytes. The red blood corpuscles are red because they are full of hemoglobin. The leukocyte, leukocyte literally means white blood cell. So what the white blood cells have no hemoglobin in them and they have completely different structure and completely different look to them. Then lastly, there's a group, we had, I mentioned them before when we talked about blood briefly, when we talked about tissues. And these are the, these very small, they're not really cells, they are fragments of a cell. They're made by a very large cell that breaks up into tiny little pieces. And uh, they are living, um, but they have no nucleus and they are called the thrombocytes. Very small compared to all of the other blood cells. The thrombocytes are quite numerous. We also call them the platelets. And their principal responsibility, not their only responsibility, but their principal responsibility is to govern the process of clotting of the blood. So all of these things are flowing around the body um, along with, you know, kind of tidally carried by the liquid, by the serum, and all of that, of course, pumped around the body initially by the force of the heartbeat, and thereafter moved by other forces back to the heart through all of the tissues. Um, so when we, as I said, when if we do this, if we take a tube and we allow the blood to clot. Here is the blood clot here. This blood clot here um, would be a mixture of red blood corpuscles and white blood cells um, all mixed up in a particular group of proteins that form the clot, the semi-solid, the gel-like clot. What is left behind is a serum. That's clear. That's also called we, that we refer to as the plasma when it's flowing through the blood vessels. So 92% water, but it has many other things um, dissolved in it, and uh, these are mostly proteins. It's very rich in proteins. The first is called fibrinogen, and fibrinogen is actually there are actually several proteins involved in composing fibrinogen, but um, fibrinogen, uh, the proteins which are f f involved in clotting, and um, they normally exist just as a dissolved protein, but under certain circumstances and cued by the platelets, they will actually form a gel, and that gel is what forms the basis of the clot. Then there is a lot of a protein called albumin. Now, albumin is a nutrient protein. Albumin is the same thing as you have in egg whites, for example. Um, and here it's dissolved in the serum. It is a nutrient. It is supplied to cells as a, as a nutrient. Um, but its main responsibility in blood is maintaining the osmotic balance of, of the blood. Um, the, that is, Main, maintaining the um, the balance, the water balance, put it that way. It's meant for maintaining the water balance of the blood in relationship to the cells that it flows past. The last group of proteins um, are a large group and very diverse group called the globulins. They have many different functions. Uh, some of the globulins are, are come from the are manufactured by the liver, 
um, but the ones that we are particularly interested in blood are those which are produced by the cells of the immune system. In fact, produced by a group of blood cells uh, which are part of the immune system. And the globulins are that group of globulins, the immune globulins, are what we know as antibody. They are proteins which are produced in response to the presence of particular pathogens, for example. And their responsibility is to inactivate those pathogens. There is a lot of interest, of course, at the moment in these, in these antibodies because of the COVID-19 epidemic. You may have heard, for example, that people who have recovered from COVID-19 may have high levels of antibody to COVID present in their blood. That is probably true. There is um, a proposed therapy which is, has been used where the plasma from a recovered patient is infused into somebody suffering from the disease in the hope that those, those antibodies artificially in now introduced will inactivate the virus. There are very mixed results, I must tell you. The results from those experiments so far are not that hopeful. Okay, so um, also present in in, in the blood, especially in the blood serum, um, are many, many other substances. First of all, nutrients. And they're dissolved in the, the blood are things like glucose, um, other sugars, other carbohydrates, fatty acids. The fatty acids are produced by a breakdown of, of uh, fats. Um, and in addition, the blood transports lipids in little tiny packages around the body. Um, those packages are called micelles. Um, so the, the, the blood, even though lipid, fatty acids and lipids do not dissolve into the, into the aqueous medium of the serum, nonetheless they can be break, broken down into very, very small amounts we say they are emuls they, they circulate in the body in the form of an, emul an emulsion. It means that they, they've been broken down into very, very small collections of molecules. They're not actually dissolved in water because lipids don't dissolve in water, nor do fats. Blue, things like sugars, fatty acids, and then also many, many amino acids. Amino acids result from the um, digestion of proteins. So and that is one of the major responsibilities of the digestive system is to break down proteins into their constituent amino acids for absorption by the blood and then distribution as nutrients to the rest of the body. Here's another component that you may well have heard of, and these are the blood electrolytes. Um, and these are, are solutes, these are salts and things dissolved into the blood as usually as ions. And um, one of them you know immediately from the, just from the taste of blood um, that we're all familiar with, and that is there's a high percentage of salt, sodium chloride, in, uh, in the serum. That there are also other salts as well, potassium chloride, for example is another one. And then very, very importantly, is this ion, that is bicarbonate ion. It's a bi bicarbonate ion, usually of sodium, sodium bicarbonate. Um, this is, uh, the bicarbonate ion is important for two reasons. I'll just go back here. Um, I told you here that the blood regulates the body pH. That is one of the big responsibilities of the bicarbonate ion. That's a rep responsibility number one of bicarbonate ion. It is a part of the pH balancing mechanism for the body. It keeps our body pH around about neutral, about pH seven. The other responsibility of the bicarbonate ion, <clears throat> just look at the name bicarbonate. 
and you'll realize that there is actually carbon in it. It's actually there in the form of uh, carbon dioxide built into the ion. And that is another responsibility of the bicarbonate ion is to transport carbon dioxide in the, in the blood. Uh, next, the blood dissolved into the blood of very, very small amounts of hormones. Hormones are uh, produced by parts of the body. For example, we have many hormones which arise uh, from the hypothalamus and uh, from the pituitary gland. Those are right up in our brains. And yet they exert tremendously powerful influence at very, very low amounts. They produce powerful effect in the, all of the rest of the body. And uh, those hormones are transported from where they are produced to the cells of the body through the blood. In addition, the blood also transports things, small amounts of vitamins and things like that. Uh, lastly, if we were to look closely, uh, we would see that there's a lot of metabolic wastes, things like urea, for example, which is produced as from the breakdown of proteins, um, things like that. And they are only in the blood temporarily. And they are transported then to organs like the kidneys for excretion. And uh, also they may, well, also if we have ingested toxins or something, or actually, which we do, by the way, whether we acquire many, many, toxins from just from the food that we eat, um, but in small amounts never, never harms us because they're transported, say, to the liver where they get processed and into harmless byproducts. The one thing I do want to uh, have you come away with um, uh, is this message here, um, that the serum is the major way in which we transport carbon dioxide from the cells back to the lungs for to be breathed out. And um, just remember that oxygen is transported by the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can transport a small amount of carbon dioxide back to the lungs to be expelled, but most of the carbon dioxide in the body is transported by the blood, by the blood serum. Okay, let's have a look at some of the cells. These, some of these you have seen before, but I'll remind you about them. Um, first of all, um, the most common blood cell is this. These are the erythrocytes, and um, they have this very distinctive shape. This um, circular, and they are biconcave, so they have a concavity on both sides like a, a donut that didn't quite make the hole. They, and um, they are packed full of this molecule, hemoglobin, which is a protein. It's a very complex protein. I'll show you in a minute. And um, the hemoglobin has at its center of each molecule, there is an iron molecule, which is what gives the hemoglobin its red color. The red color comes from that, that iron atom sitting in the middle of the hemoglobin. Um, the, there's something strange about the red blood cells. They're a living cell, but they have no nucleus. Um, and there's some other peculiarities to them that we'll talk about in a while. Um, the, rest, the rest of the, of the entire cells um, are the white blood cells or the leukocytes. And um, I'll talk about their function in a minute. I'll just point out, we classify these cells uh, by various things. First of all, by their shape. We can recognize the different kinds by their shape. But second of all, uh, very importantly, by the shape of the nucleus. So this is the nucleus in the middle here. This, these ones here have these very peculiar lobe, <coughs> lobed nuclei. Uh, they take many different forms. Um, and you can immediately recognize them because they have these different parts to them. Then this, have a look here though, and you'll see this one here just has a single nucleus. And I always tell people it's like the peach emoji. You see there, like that. It's bilobed, 
the nucleus like that. So these here are small cells called the neutrophils, usually the commonest white blood cell that's visible. These are called monocytes and they are large cells. They exist in one form in the blood and then they have another fate that I'll tell you about in a minute. These ones here are called lymphocytes and they are recognizable because they are small cells and the nucleus just about fills the cell. There's very little cytoplasm there. Okay. These here are called eosinophils and basophils. They get their name from the staining reaction. It's a particular staining stain that we use, and these stain in a particular way. The eosinophils stain a reddish color. The basophils stain a bluish color. And we'll, I'll talk about what they do in, in a minute. Um, those of you who suffer from allergies, by the way, my, will be very interested in these two because they commonly involved in the process of allergy. The last ones that I want to mention are these here, and I left them to last because they're not really, they're kind of strange because they're not actually cells, they're fragments of a cell. Uh, they're made, as I told you, by a large cell which breaks up into tiny little pieces. And um, they, they don't live for very long, but, but they are extremely important in, in the body. These are the, are the platelets or thrombocytes. And these um, have two forms. They have a free form like this. And then if thrombocytes actually encounter a surface which, to, to which they stick and stop, they adopt another form. They start putting out these little extensions which attach them. And as soon as that happens, they will start releasing substances which will cause the blood to clot. Under normal circumstances, the platelets just carry on circulating around and around and around in the blood circulatory system. Um, but if anything happens to stop them, or which causes them to abut on a surface and adhere, they will start releasing clotting factors. So you will realize that if we have a cut, for example, the blood actually stops flowing properly there. It starts to pool and the blood platelets then start to release, their clot, release the substances which will cause a clot to form. Unfortunately, the same thing can happen even if you don't have a cut. If you in a blood vessel, if you have somewhere in the blood vessel where you slow the blood down and the blood platelets start to attach, for instance, if um, you have coatings inside a blood vessel, like cholesterol or something like that, that platelets can butt up against and slow down and attach, you can form a clot there. And that is the origin of, uh, of a thrombosis. A clotting which takes place inside the blood vessel and can end up blocking the blood vessel. Okay, let's have a look here. Uh, just a few of them for you. First of all, the most obvious are all of the many, 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 many red blood cells or erythrocytes um, in the background. Circular. Uh, you can't, it's not. Uh, this coloration in the middle is because they have this biconcave shape, but it's difficult to see in a microscope preparation. Um, so those are the red blood corpuscles in the background. These here are white blood corpuscles or leukocytes, and these here are neutrophils. You can tell that they're neutrophils because look at the nucleus. Look at all the different shapes. This is one nucleus, by the way but it's all in these strange lobes like this. And there's no, not much else to see in the cytoplasm. Um, and these are the neutrophils, the most common of all of the white blood corpuscles in your blood. Uh, this is a perfectly normal blood slide. Um, the, this here is a monocyte here. And again, you can see that because it's got this bilobed peach emoji nucleus there. Okay, quite a large cell. Um, this one here, a smallish cell, 
with a nucleus that just about fills the, the whole cell, and that is a lymphocyte. And uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about the lymphocytes in a while. Then lastly, these here are the platelets. They're kind of, they're small, irregularly shaped, um, and uh, they can be quite numerous. You can see, often see quite a few of them in a blood site here. There's just a little clump of them at the site. So neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, erythrocytes, and thrombocytes or platelets. So just a word about how blood cell, these blood cells are actually formed. The process of blood formation, of blood cell formation rather, is called hematopoiesis. That's a name you need to remember, hematopoiesis. Literally means the birthing of blood. And this takes place in the red marrow of the bones. Red marrow is a spongy, bony tissue often towards the end of the bones. And that it, it's tremendously important in blood formation and in the functioning of the immune system. Um, so all blood cells actually arise from one kind of cell, which is called the blood stem cell. So they, they start off development, there's just one blood stem cell. And they then, after that stem cell divides, uh, the progeny of the division go on to form all of the various uh, blood cell types in quite a complex uh, manner, which we won't uh, discuss much. So the red blood cells have exactly the same origin. They come from the same uh, blood stem cells, um, but they go through a, a development where they lose their nucleus and they lose most of the cellular machinery that we've talked about before. Um, if you examine them, they have some, but not, not much. They are still regarded as being living cells. They still have a certain metabolism, everything. But they are packed full of this molecule called hemoglobin. Because they have no... They, they have no cell machinery to maintain the, 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 the metabolism of the cell or repair mechanisms and that sort of thing. They are not long lived. They live for about four months before they die. But we produce red blood cells continuously from the red marrow of the bones. So we continuously replacing our red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells that die, <clears throat> by the way, um, are processed by the liver. The hemoglobin is processed. And believe it or not, the, one of the products of that processing of dead, of dead red blood cells is bile, which is a digestive fluid, which we'll talk about when we talk about digestion. Um, <clears throat> so there, the, there are several thousand hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell. So uh, this is, you don't need to, I just remember this. This is just to show an illustration for you, to show you that um, first of all, we have, all blood cells arise from one kind of stem cell. Now this is very, in therapeutic terms, this is very useful because if people are suffering from uh, disorders of the blood, for example, there is a possibility of extracting stem cells, um, treating them uh, to correct any mistakes, let's say, and then putting them back into the blood circulatory system in the hopes that they will carry on pro now producing normal uh, blood cells. That is a therapeutic line of investigation, which is very, very current. So the, the um, I, I'll just mention that the, the, this uh, ancestor, let's call it. And they're continually pre present in our blood. Um, we have them the whole time. Um, and they, they're continually dividing to produce all of the, the different blood cells. But when they divide, the cells that result can proceed along two paths. One of them is produced to produce the um, lymphoid cells that I described before, these small cells with a single nucleus in the middle and uh, just about fills the cell. I'll have another word to say about it in a minute. 
the other line of development is all of the others. Red blood cells, um, all sorts of, all the different, lots of different kinds um, of leukocytes and the thrombocytes. They all proceed from this ancestor here. So this one gives, has progeny, either this or this. This one here has lots and lots of divisions and progeny, etc. produces all of these. And this one produces the lymphoid cells. Now, I just want to say a word about um, the, the lymphoid. These are mainly involved in the immune response, um, a particular branch of the immune response. So, um, and it is from these, for example, that we get our antibodies eventually. Um, the, it is this line that is going to produce our antibodies. This line, this line here has all sorts of other responsibilities. Okay, let's have a look at the hemoglobin. No, you don't. I'm not going to question you about the ins and outs of the of the hemoglobin structure. I just want to point out to you uh, the hemoglobin molecule actually consists of four proteins. One, two, three, four. Um, in a single unit, which is a very complex substance. And then right in the middle, there is a specialized molecule uh, called a heme, H-E-M-E -E molecule. That's where hemoglobin comes from. And that's the molecule that has an iron molecule in the middle, right? So that's the, the and um, the, the, that is what actually gives blood its red color. And hemoglobin has this peculiar property. And that is, you take hemoglobin, you put it into an oxygen-rich environment. Each of these chains here will pick up an oxygen and bind it. So it gets bound to it. And it'll stay there as long as the oxygen environment is rich. But if you transport this hemoglobin somewhere where oxygen is poor, it loses its ability to hold onto the oxygen and the oxygen is freed. So this is very useful because we can put, take our, our hemoglobin, put it into an environment like the lungs, for example, where there's lots of oxygen. It will pick up oxygen there. Then we send it off we, by a heartbeat, etc. We transport that hemoglobin to an area like our fingertips where the cells have been sitting there metabolizing and they've produced, they've used up all their oxygen. So the oxygen is poor there. When the hemoglobin reaches here, it's going to drop its oxygen and it's going to feed the cells with oxygen. And the hemoglobin then gets returned to the lungs by the blood circulatory system to pick up more oxygen. Meanwhile, by the way, the serum, blood serum picks up most of the carbon dioxide and similarly, it transports it back to the lungs where it, it, where it is breathed out. So that's, that's the principle of use of, of hemoglobin as the principal oxygen carrying mechanism. So um, we, one of the health measures is to look at how much hemoglobin is present in the blood. Men use slightly higher, 14 to 18 uh, grams of uh, per 100 mil and uh, women 12 to 16 grams per 100 mil. Less than that you would judge to be anemic and I'll talk about that in a while. There are various reasons why you could have a low uh, hemoglobin count. So um, on this I just want to mention one strange circumstance. Um, one of the commonest um, uh, forms of poisoning is actually carbon monoxide poison. Um, we, in our homes, for example, we use many, many different forms of combustion. We use gas to, to heat our homes. We use gas to, to cook. We use gas, for example, to, uh, to heat the water, whatever. So we have combustion going on in our homes the whole time. And um, 
if combustion occurs um, inefficiently, and especially if something goes wrong with the venting systems, taking waste gases out from our heating system or whatever, a, car, a gas called carbon monoxide is produced, not carbon dioxide, which is CO2, but carbon monoxide, CO. Here's a problem. Um, our bodies are designed, it's in fact in your medulla oblongata, they are sensors. And what they, are, what they measure is not the levels of oxygen in your blood, but they measure the amount of carbon dioxide. That is all that they react to. They react to carbon dioxide. If carbon dioxide starts to build up in your blood, it induces you, the medulla oblongata, induces you to breathe faster and oxygenate your blood. If the carbon dioxide carries on going up, if you're in an environment, for example, where there's a lot of carbon dioxide building up, it, it, the medulla oblongata induces panic, a physiological panic. And the, the survival advantage of that is that it may cause you to run away, to run from the environment in which you're in to one where there's not so much of carbon dioxide. Here's the problem. This gas, carbon monoxide, does not induce that because your body only reacts to carbon dioxide, not to carbon monoxide. You can go into an environment rich in carbon monoxide and not even notice that something bad is happening. And what happens with carbon monoxide is that it binds irreversibly to hemoglobin. It's, it binds as if, in a way as if it was oxygen accepting that it can't be dropped by the hemoglobin and it blocks the hemoglobin from picking up oxygen. Now, there are initial symptoms. Uh, people may notice that they're dizzy or they're feeling nauseous um, and a predominant feeling is fatigue, sleepiness, drowsiness. And this can happen very, very rapidly the levels of carbon monoxide in the blood can build up very rapidly and people go unconscious and then die. From They effectively suffocate without even noticing that they are suffocating because their carbon dioxide levels don't go up. And um, this is actually a common cause of poisoning and of accidental death. And it actually in fires where a, a house burns or something like that, the carbon monoxide poisoning is the commonest cause of death, not burning. People's bodies usually burn after they are dead, after they have already died because of carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay, <clears throat> on that cheerful note. Um, so let's have a, a talk just about some of the functions of some of the white blood cells. So. First of all, tell you, neutrophils, again, are the commonest of all of the leukocytes. They have another name, and that is polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Polymorphonuclear, because this nucleus adopts so many different forms. Almost every neutrophil <coughs> you see has its own shape to its nucleus. Um, they are often termed the soldiers of the immune response, <coughs> because these are these are the cells <clears throat> that actually do most of the work of attacking uh, things like bacteria. If you, for example, spike yourself with a thorn or something and you introduce bacteria beneath the skin um, into the tissues of the body, the immune res system responds very quickly in a way I'll describe in a minute. But the cells that actually come in and do most of the killing and eating of the bacteria at that the site of infection are these, the neutrophils. And they are called to a site of infection. If you have, a, if you have bacteria present under your skin, site of infection, there are, there, the immune system has ways of calling the neutrophils, all the neutrophils in the body, to come and congregate around the site of infection. And they 
they get there in the blood circulatory system. And once they arrive at the site of infection, they can actually creep out of the blood vessels and into the tissues to begin the work of attacking the pathogens. Um, they actively feed, they are like little amoebae. They actively feed on bacteria. They're very short lived though. Um, and very soon they burn out and, and die. But the, uh, one of the other responses of the immune system is that it instructs the red bone marrow to make lots of neutrophils if there's a site of infection. So they are very soon replaced. There's a continual arrival of the neutrophils to a site of infection. They very soon die and they accumulate there. They don't get conducted away rapidly. They accumulate as pus. That is what you observe as that white, creamy colored substance that forms around a site of infection. So those are all, that is dead neutrophils who've, been, who've done their job and have died. So uh, the neutrophils are actually summoned to a site of infection by um, what, by a monocyte, I, I wouldn't say by monocytes. I'll tell you this. Monocytes, um, we, this is a monocyte that we see in the blood slide. This is what it looks like when it's circulating in the blood circulatory system. But monocytes have the ability and the fate that they actually leave the blood circulatory system and they move through all of our tissues. Um, and they move through the tissues, they form two kinds of cells. The one is macrophage. And macrophages are the surveillance cells. They are the guardsmen. They are out there looking the whole time to see whether pathogens have, have been introduced into the tissues. Um, then the other kind of cell that the monocytes form is called a dendritic cell. And the dendritic cell is also a, a guard, it's also on surveillance, but the dendritic cell, if it sees something and uh, a pathogen, whatever, it acquires information about the pathogen and then it moves off to the lymphatic system. The macrophages do not. They carry on moving around inside the tissues. But if they encounter, if the macrophages encounter pathogens, for example, they will eat them, they phagocytose them. They are an amoeboid cell, it looks just like a little amoeba, and it eats just like a little amoeba. It will reach out with the legs, little extensions, enclose the pathogen and eat it. And it will then release hormones and it releases hormones that inform the rest of the immune system that something has happened, that a pathogen has arrived. And that is what summons the neutrophils. The neutrophils are summoned by these macrophages and the macrophages actually call them in. They, the macrophages encourage the red blood cells to make more lots of neutrophils and they, they also bring the neutrophils to the site of infection so that the neutrophils can bombard the pathogens, eat them all, eat them all up, and hopefully get rid of the infection. If the, that infection is not efficiently dealt with, or if it is something, for example, um, which the dendritic cells see, which the macrophages can't see, like a virus, then the dendritic cells, which are also circulate as monocytes in the bloodstream, dendritic cells inform the rest of the immune system and tell the rest of the immune system that the next stage of the immune response must be resorted to, and that is the production of antibody to the pathogens. So the ma macrophage is largely responsible for an initial response, which, often, which most times works. Most times we deal perfectly efficiently with infections very, very quickly. Um, that's, and, but sometimes you need to move up to another level of immune response, and that is the production of antibody. So you realize 
these bl blood cells are intimately involved in the immune response in keeping us healthy recognizing that pathogens have entered the tissue for example <clears throat> and that something needs to be done about it so that antibody response is part of a whole immune response called the adaptive response we'll talk about it much later on but uh, i'll just mention to you when we see lymphocytes present in the blood this is what they look like the cells with this large nucleus filling the cell they're relatively small we cannot tell when we see them circulating like this we can't tell what kind of lymphocyte they are and um, there are numerous lymphocytes the first are called b lymphocytes and b lymphocytes are the ones which will go on to produce antibody they're the ones that actually produce those globulins that circulate in the blood that fight pathogens there's another kind of lymphocyte called a t helper cell t helper cells interact with b cells to produce to help to get them to produce antibody and um, t helper cells you may have heard of because t helper cells are the, one of the cells that is very badly affected by hiv human immunodeficiency virus um, <clears throat> t helper cells are the cells which are primarily attacked by hiv and the loss of t helper cells ends up impairing the immune system the next kind also t cells are called cytotoxic t cells and cytotoxic t cells act, are actually able to recognize cells that are infected um, with it with a particular pathogen and they will directly attack that those cells and kill them that's why the cytotoxic cell killing t cells they kill cells that are infected for example with virus the last ones are cells called uh, lymphocytes called natural killer cells and natural killer cells extremely interesting group and they are one of the parts of the immune system that surveys for tumor cells for example if they see a cell that looks like a tumor cell they will kill it so these are all lymphocytes when we see them circulating in the blood we can't tell what kind they are we can we tell by their location in other tissues and by their activity by the way in which they act now this, these ones here uh, the um, are called basophils and um, here's a this is a basophil and uh, you can see it's this deep blue color uh, baso it's basic it's alkaline and it's it stains blue now i'm just going to mention these um, uh, especially for those of you for example who have allergies the basophils and this other group of cells called the mast cells are quite similar um, in that they both contain masses of uh, substance, for example, histamine. Now that should, is a word which should be familiar to all of you. Histamine, allergy, you take antihistamines for this very reason. Histamine causes various effects on blood vessels. Histamine causes blood vessels to dilate, for example. It causes blood vessels to become leaky, to start leaking serum that all of those sorts of things mast cells are present in all of our tissues through our body and they react very very quickly they react very quickly for example to tissue damage or to shock even for example if you smack your hand hard it turns red right one of the reasons it turns red mast cells immediately react and start releasing histamine to cause the blood vessels to dilate and your skin reddens so mast cells act very, very quickly. Basophils have a similar action. They also release histamine substances like that, but they are a long-term. Basophils come in after, uh, if that irritation or whatever lasts a long time, basophils come in. And, <clears throat> and so they, basophils become very important in long-running 
situations like asthma, things like that, um, and also cause similar effects to the mast cells. Okay, so just to finish off for today, here is a, a little diagram for you, um, the various functions of these various cells, basophils, mast cells, neutrophils, eosinophils don't worry about for the moment, monocytes, and macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cell, I'll just mention a plasma cell is a B cell which is releasing antibody. And then lastly, the dendritic cells. Okay, so that's in summary for today and we'll carry on with this on Monday. Thank you.